Good morning. The great and mighty Wizard of Oz. How are you all doing today? Good. Good. I'm doing fine as well. When you came in, you got a bulletin if you want to take that. Open it up. There's uh, some verses in there we're going to be looking at today, as well as a place where you can jot a couple of things down. Let's go to the Lord and spend a few minutes in prayer, and then we'll look at the scripture. Father, we thank you for this morning, and we know, Lord, that um, you have something unique today. You love people, and you speak to them, and you guide them. Lord, you're a living God who calls us to know you, and so I would just pray today that you would work in your power. We don't know what you want to do, but we know that in your love, and in your sovereignty, and your power, and in your, your plan, you have something, and so we just look to you and thank you for your presence in us and with us, and we trust you for all that you want to do. We pray today that in all that we do, Jesus would be seen for who he really is, meaning, Lord, that he would be honored and glorified as the King of heaven and earth, the Savior of the world. So we thank you for this uh, time together, and we just pray your blessing over it in Jesus' name. Amen. When you are uh, a pastor, you can count on a couple of different things. And one of those things is that when difficult times come in people's lives, you're going to get a phone call. You guys never call me when good things are coming. Just saying, okay? When your bad things come, and that's, that's as it should be, I guess. But part of what that means is that uh, you are there a lot of times during uh, crisis and during death and, and all like this. And often, the person that has passed away or is in crisis is not somebody you know directly. It's somebody who is related to somebody who maybe is related to somebody else who you know directly. And so over the years I've kind of learned how to navigate that a little bit, but very often what that means is when you go in to a grieving situation and then really into do a, a memorial, you don't really even know the person that you're doing the memorial for. You maybe have never met that person, and you're just going on what the family members have said about them. And, you know, at times of, of grieving, our minds do all kinds of things. Once I was doing a, a funeral. This woman had lived into her 90s, and we were uh, doing the funeral at the, the cemetery. It wasn't in the, the church. And the family was all there. It was a smaller group, maybe about 20, 25 people. You know, the sons and daughters of this woman were there, and the grandkids were there, most of whom were kind of teenage, teenagers. And so we went through the, the basic service. The family members didn't want to do anything. They wanted me to handle it all, which is often the case. So I started into my service that I had prepared, and I'm going through the, the different motions, and everyone's just sitting there very quietly, and no one's really saying a word, and interestingly, no one's really grieving, no one's crying, they're all just sitting there listening to me. And as I went on and on and on, they're kind of looking at each other and then looking at me, but nobody's really doing much. And finally, I got to this uh, point in the memorial, and I said, okay, uh, I've been kind of been talking about this person, but in reality, I really don't know uh, your mother, your grandmother, does anybody want to take a minute and just share a memory or, or share uh, something about her? Uh, anybody? Well, it's kind of quiet for a minute. And then one of the grandkids stands up and, I don't know, says something about she made good cookies or I don't know, something like that, right? And then it's still kind of quiet. And, and uh, then another grandkid stands up and says something but none of her kids, who are all adults about my age, are saying a word. And so the grandkids, two or three or four of them sort of share. And then it gets kind of quiet. And then it gets kind of uncomfortably quiet. And then it gets kind of painfully quiet. And finally, as people are kind of looking at each other and one or two more grandkids maybe have something, one of the sons of the woman stands up and says... You know, let's face it, she was a mean 
woman. And I went, okay, shall we pray? <laughs> now, what do you do? So I said, why don't you talk about that for a minute? And he said, she was mean to everybody she knew. She was mean to us raising kids. She was mean to our father. She was mean to the neighbors. Uh, the last 30 years of her life, none of us wanted anything to do with her, and she didn't want anything to do with us. When we tried to build any kind of inroads in a relationship, she basically told us what she thought of us and basically said, get out of our lives. We tried to help her. She would cuss us out and say, I don't need your blankety-blank help. Leave me alone. And that was basically the state that she died in, having severed all of her relationships. The grandkids she would give a little latitude to, but her own children she wanted not much really to do with. One of the things about being a pastor is you get pictures of what people are really like. And what I walked away from this experience with was the basic observation, which, by the way, I make with every memorial and funeral I do, all based on predominantly the people that knew the person we're memorializing. And it was pretty easy to recognize in this woman's case, it was fair to say that she had lived her life in a wrong direction. There are good roads to take and there are wrong roads to take. There are roads that lead to joy and happiness and building relationships and encouragement and strengthening family and strengthening community. And there are roads that go in the exact opposite direction that break down relationships and break down family and break down community and discourage and dishearten and debilitate people's emotions. There are good roads and there are wrong roads. And it was pretty obvious which road this woman, for whatever reasons, had chosen to take. It's a real warning, I think, when you step away from an experience like this to recognize, you know, I got a choice too. I could go down that road too. Someday I'm going to be, you know, laying in a box or, you know, really small in an urn or something. And my kids are going to have something to say about me. The people I know who outlive me, my friends, are going to have something to say about me. And in essence, it's either going to be Kevin went down a really good positive road and we're going to miss him, or he went down a really wrong road and nobody's really going to miss him. Where it becomes really dangerous is when our wrong roads, that by and large are there to benefit us, when our wrong roads are cloaked in a kind of religion or are cloaked in a sort of spirituality, when we do things that are really, really wrong, that are hurtful or destructive, that hurt our kids, that hurt our families, that hurt our friends, that break down relationships, but we do it, quote, in God's name. You know, I, I've got to do this because this is the will of the Lord. And you want to flip open the scriptures and say, no, I think this is the will of the Lord about loving, encouraging, building. When it's cloaked in religion it becomes really dangerous. In Jesus' day, as in today, there were people who made their money from religion, just like me. Why are we doing this passage? No. And Jesus had some very serious and stern warnings to the people of his day about certain religious leaders. I want to read the passage to you and explain kind of the historic context of what's going on, but recognize that when Jesus begins this statement, he's saying, in effect, beware. Beware of these people because they can, if you follow their example lead you down very dangerous roads. And not only can they lead you down dangerous roads that look like spirituality, but they don't mind misusing you to fulfill their agendas and to line their pockets in the process. 
Let's look at what Jesus has to say. Now remember, it's the last week of his life before the crucifixion... ...and then three days later, the resurrection. He's in Jerusalem. The city is swollen with people. About a million Jews and proselytes have come to the city to celebrate the Passover. It's the largest Jewish feast of the year, even to this day. Jesus is at the temple and he's doing a lot of teaching. People recognize him as something unique. They're just not sure what. There are also religious leaders all over the place that are listening to what he has to say. Mark tells us this. As he taught, Jesus said... Watch out. It's a very strong word in the Greek. Caution, caution. Danger, danger. Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes. I'll explain that in a minute. And be greeted in the marketplaces. And have the most important seats in the synagogue. And the places of honor at banquets. Now let me explain those four things. Jesus is going to give us one more ...to show the results of all this. But let me give you these four things. Flowing robes were robes that they wore... ...that had tassels on the end of them... ...that were to remind them of the covenant they had with God... ...and the commands they were supposed to obey. They had particularly longer ones made out... ...so that when they were doing their prayers... ...or any kind of religious teaching or service... ...they would be recognized as the men in charge... They were meant to be worn during religious duties, but the teachers of the law took up to wearing these every place. In some forms of Christianity, the pastor or minister will stand up and he'll teach with clerical robes on. You've probably seen this, right? But imagine if that guy wore his robes or her robes, that woman, around, you know, going to Albertsons or whatever, right? They would kind of stand out as, why are you doing this in this kind of funny looking choir robe thing? But that's what they did. They wore their religious robes around town. Greetings in the marketplace. This is an interesting one. The greeting in the marketplace worked like this. If you were one of the teachers of the law or people in religious power, when you walked through the marketplace where people gathered from day to day, you would never walk up and say hello to someone. It was always on them as the underling ...to acknowledge you, to say hello and to give you a very kind of honorable greeting. And then once they did that, then you could look at them and you would acknowledge their presence. Think of it like a salute. A soldier or a sailor, when they see an officer, have to stop what they're doing and give a salute. The officer never salutes first. And it's a very clear picture of who's in charge, who has sort of the place of importance... When a soldier or sailor salutes, they're saying, this man, this woman is in charge. This is my superior. Greeting in the marketplace worked the same way. If you saw one of these religious leaders, you were to stop what you were doing and greet them in a specific way, acknowledging them as your superior. The third one is that they like the most important seats in the synagogue. They began a practice, synagogue, by the way, is where the Jews met on the Sabbath to read the scriptures and to talk about them and to have prayers. The teachers of the law had taken up to putting seats in the front of the synagogue. But the thing about these seats is that they turned them around so that the teachers of the law sat up in front and were facing everybody else. So that as you were listening to Torah, you were seeing the men lined up that were the most important men sitting in synagogue with you. When I first uh, started ministry a long time ago, we did the same thing. Have you ever seen that? Where the pastor will be preaching and there will be chairs lined up and all of the ministers or pastors will be sitting on those chairs facing out at the congregation. Have you ever seen that? I never liked that. I never liked sitting up there. You know, you start dozing off, everybody knows, right? I never really liked it. But they did exactly the same thing. And then the whole idea, the fourth thing Jesus says of places of honor at the banquet, if you were one of the wealthy elite, you would throw banquets. Very much like now we throw parties and you invite you know, the popular people in a community. Well, they were the religious celebrities. They were the rock stars in their religion. And so to invite them and have them come was kind of a feather in your cap, as it were. 
And so they would, they would go to these things and everybody would know that they, as sort of the elite religious leaders, made that banquet or party special. Now Jesus has a, a fifth thing to say about them. In verse 40 he says, They, still talking about these teachers of the law, devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers and then he concludes, such men will be punished most severely. Now here's what he has in mind with these final statements. The idea of devouring widows' houses simply meant that they would consume the wealth of widows. Now there's two things you ought to know about widows. One, they had no legal rights in that community. And so as they would have their wealth consumed through different religious laws, uh, uh, the teachers of the law could demand certain amounts to be given and things like that, and they had no recourse to fight that. But the other interesting thing about widows is that God, throughout the Old Testament, specifically says that widows should be cared for and protected by the religious leadership. And so those who are the religious leadership teaching those laws are actually the ones themselves doing what the very laws say not to do. About eight years ago, there was a, a man who pastored a church back in the, the, uh, the kind of southeast area. The church had 19,000 members. He'd written many, many books, kind of an evangelical guy, well, very evangelical, and oversaw the, the Evangelical Association of America. Everybody knew him. And he would preach on righteousness, and he would preach on holiness, and he would talk about the need to follow Jesus in purity and all of these kinds of things. And he was very, very popular till it came out that he had had a series of homosexual affairs, by the way, something else he preached against, and suddenly everybody went, wow, the very word you're preaching, you're walking in the exact opposite direction. That was the teachers of the law. And the whole idea about their showy prayers basically just meant that even in their religious acts, they were insincere. They were doing it for a show. Maybe they were doing it for a show to cover up all the other stuff they were doing. But the bottom line is that their prayers, like everything else they did, were simply meant to show just how important they were to everybody else. All of these things really can be summarized in a basic issue. And the issue was this. They were using their position for their own benefit instead of using it for the benefit of other people. And Jesus points that out as being a very dangerous thing. They knew the law better than anybody, but they followed it less than anybody. They were going in the wrong direction. God called them, and he calls you and me to walk in a right direction. Now, we could open the New Testament, and we could look at all kinds of things, maybe hundreds of things that we could say, this is the direction God would call us in, a, a direction of real faith, a direction of, of real spirituality. You know, we, we could come up with a lot of different things. I want to give you four today that I think are very central to what it looks like to live in God's direction. The first one that stands out all over the scriptures is that living in God's direction means, first and foremost, knowing Jesus personally. Knowing Jesus personally. The teachers of the law, like a lot of us today, are all about religion and the religion's structures and institutions that are associated with that. But Jesus never came to start a religion. Jesus never came to teach us new rules and regulations we needed to follow or rituals that we were supposed to abide by. Jesus came to draw us into a relationship with himself. He came to save us from death and the darkness that our sins had brought on us. 
to remove that so that we could step into a relationship with God. When the scripture talks about it, one of the wonderful words it uses is the word reconciliation. Our relationship with God had been broken off because of our sin. Jesus came to reconcile us into a personal relationship with God. The question we should ask is not how am I doing in my religion? Or am I following certain laws? Or am I living a certain kind of life? Am I doing things that would please God? That's not the first question. The first question is, do I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That's the first question. God never calls you to follow rules and regulations. Jesus never said, come to me and follow these 600 commandments or something like that. Jesus always just simply said, follow me. Which means get to know me, live my way, walk in my ways, trust me for your eternal life. Follow me. John, the apostle, at the end of his life, sums it up like this. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship or relationship, communion, connection. Fellowship with us. Now look what he says. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. It's very different, very different to live a religious life and to live a life of relationship with the living God. It's very, very different. One follows rules and regulations. One follows a person named Jesus Christ. One is concerned about doing right and wrong. One is concerned about listening to a person and walking in a sort of mutual connection with that person. One one, uh, follows rules and duties and rituals. Another one listens and pays attention to a person and gets to know that person better. One connects, one just goes through the motions. My question for me, as for you, is never going to be, how are you doing in your religious life? It's always going to be, do you know Jesus Christ? Do you really know him? Just now, as you are jotting down, knowing Jesus personally, is that true about you? And if you were to say, well, yes, it is, what would be the evidence of that? People know I'm married. Because I live like a married guy. I'm always smiling and happy. Just trying to earn some brownie points. No, seriously. Seriously. People know things about you because you live in a certain way. If you're in relationship with Jesus, you're going to live like a person in relationship with Jesus, not like a religious person. The world's full of religious people. That's very, very different. Central to walking in God's direction is knowing Jesus and obeying him. Now, how do I begin this journey of walking with Jesus. How do I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? What do I do? How do I enter into this? I want to show you a passage I really like. It's actually written to people who claimed to have a relationship but didn't live like it at all. And Jesus in the book of Revelation 3 gives them a pretty stern warning about that. But let me read this to you. I really like it because it it gives a good, solid image Jesus is speaking through the Apostle John, who's jotting down this vision he's seeing. And the words of the Lord are this. Look. In other words, pay attention. I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. Now, the whole concept of a meal together is in the ancient Near East. To share a meal with someone was a basic statement that you were in relationship with that person. They were someone who was significant and in connection with you. When Jesus says, we'll share a meal, he's saying, we belong to one another. We're in connection together. And you know, where Jesus is, so will you be. If Jesus is with the Father in heaven, then that's where you will be. 
It's the whole idea of being rightly related to another person. In this case, to Jesus Christ. But here's what I really want you to see in this passage. Jesus doesn't say, look, I'm going to kick the door open and come in. Jesus says, I'm knocking at the door. If I can put it this way, your life has a door. And Jesus knocks at that door and says, do you want to open the door? Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, speaks to men, women, and children, to their spirit, to their heart, and brings that sense where we understand that he's there and he's saying, are you interested in coming into relationship with me, in me being your Lord and your Savior? Are you interested? You can never convince someone to follow Jesus, nor should you try. Jesus will do the talking. You can explain about Christ, but don't try to push someone in it. I recognize with my kids, I could basically say, okay, all of you right now are going to line up and pray to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and next week you're getting baptized. And it would mean nothing. I don't want to tell them that they should respond to Christ. I want to tell them about Christ, how he's changed my life, and then let Jesus do the talking to them. Because he loves them more than I do. He knows them more than I do. He can speak to them better than I can. I can urge them in this, but I'm never going to force them in this. David, you get the door. It's driving me crazy. So my question is, is Jesus knocking at your door right now? Maybe at some point in your life, you made a, a commitment to Jesus. You, you received Christ as Lord and Savior. You felt like he was knocking at the door of your life, and you opened that door, and you accepted his invitation and said, yes, I want you to be my Savior. I want to know you personally. I want a personal relationship with you, with the Father in heaven. I want that. But where you find yourself today is very distant. Remember, this passage is not written to people who had never made a decision for Jesus. It's written to people who had made a decision for Jesus. I either choose to open or I don't. Let me give you the second one. Along with knowing Jesus personally, having a personal relationship with God, the second one, the second way I, I live in God's direction is loving other people willingly. Loving others willingly. I know Jesus personally. I love others willingly. To love others willingly means I make a choice to love people, to forgive, to connect, to help, to encourage. We, we have to choose if we're going to do these things or not. Again, uh, I know a lot of you aren't married, but, but you can still grab where I'm going with this, okay? Raise your hand if you're married. Just raise your hand. Just pop your hand up real quick. Okay, put your hand down. Okay. Raise your hand if when you first said I do to this person, you connected, you had all kinds of wonderful emotion and love for this person. Raise your hand there. You better all put up your hand, guys. Good. Good. Okay. Now, the next one. Raise your hand if you've been married for some length of time and those emotion and that joy and that passion and that has never, never ceased. Raise your hand. You are such liars, you guys who raised your hand. I need to choose my words carefully here. If you're not married, I'll just fill you in on something. Disney has lied to you. <laughs> Happily ever after is a choice that two people must mutually make. It's a choice to love in spite of how I'm feeling. It's a choice to forgive in spite of what has occurred. It's a choice to sacrifice what benefits me to benefit another in spite of what I may want 
or even feel like I am entitled to at that moment. If I'm going to love, there's always going to be an aspect of my will involved in that love. Now, sometimes it's very easy. I have the emotional energy in that and, and uh, you know, just the passion in that and the purpose. And, man, it's easy to show all kinds of love. But, but the deepest love looks like a choice that you make when you don't want to make that choice. The deepest love looks like real forgiveness, real sacrifice, when you'd rather not do those things. That's what real love looks like. We looked at this passage last week, but let me show it to you again. The centrality of love. Jesus makes this statement. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And you do that, of course, because you're in a personal relationship with him. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. You want to know what God wants from you? He wants you to learn to love other people. I read a lot about the church in America, and um, it's always interesting to me to read about what goes on, not uh, just with the folks that gather from week to week or whatever, but behind the scenes. And particularly to read about it in what we've uh, coined the phrase of the mega church, you know, staff. You know, people have staffs of, you know, 100 or 200 people. And more and more, what you discover is that there is so much dysfunction in those staffs. There's, there's so much breakdown. When I was in college, I had a, a friend that was on a very, very large church staff. And we would hang out. And we, when we would sit down and go to dinner or whatever, you know, just kind of connect, talk about assignments, because this person was in the same college as I was, they would just almost grieve because this was a young person that was heading for ministry, got this job as sort of an, an assistant on a giant church staff, thought it was going to be wonderful and saw more dysfunction than they had ever seen. People talking about each other, gossiping about each other, uh, uh, ripping on each other, people, people um, lying to one another. All kinds of anger and hostility and frustration and all of this kind of stuff. And my friend at one point just kind of looked and said, I, I don't know if I want to really do this. If this is what goes on behind the scenes, maybe I should look at something else for my career. If we can't love one another, how are we going to love the people in the community and in the world around us, right? What does God want from me? Well, he wants you to know him. He wants you to learn about him. He wants you to walk in personal relationship with him. And as you're doing that, he wants you to willingly choose to love other people. Let me give you the third. The third is this. As I'm walking in the Lord's direction, part of the centrality of that is that I'm going to be serving God freely. Serving God freely. That means this. When you look at what Christ brings to a person's life, and that you're walking in a relationship and not just living out a religion, you begin to recognize a couple of things. And I want you to pay very close attention to what I'm about to say, okay? The first thing you begin to see unfold is that there is no one-size-fits-all path to walk with Jesus. I want to say it again. There is no one size fits all path to walking with Jesus. Just like this person in the relationship with their parents or spouse or kids or friends, their relationship is going to look very different than this relationship. There are certain character qualities there. But what it looks like in day to day is going to be very different. Very different. We can get so locked into the idea of one size fits all. The way God is working in me is the way he's got to work in you. Let me tell you something. God didn't call you to constraints. God called you to freedom. When you walk with the Lord, it's going to look different than other people's relationships look. You can learn from them. But God calls you to freedom. I had a friend in seminary that was going through very well-known discipleship ministry. 
And I was hanging out at his apartment one day, and I noticed these 12 binders, big white binders, this thick, every one of them, sitting up on this giant bookshelf. And I said, what is that? I thought it was seminary notes. And he said, I'm going through a discipleship program. It's like a four-year discipleship program. And I said, they want you to know all of that stuff? He said, oh, yeah, every day I spend an hour going through these manuals so that I can be discipled. And I'm thinking, man, I... <laughs> when do you sleep? When do you pray? When do you show love for other people? It was so vast that that, uh, that was their idea of what you had to do to be a disciple. You know what being a disciple means? It means you know Jesus and learn from him day by day. That's what being a disciple means. And one of the problems with the Western world that we live in is we're so enamored and in love with our stuff we know, our knowledge, that we lose sight of the guy who said the knowledge in the first place, Jesus Christ. And we start following the knowledge instead of Jesus. One of the reasons people are running from the church and from God in the, in the American society we live in is because we say, here's the things you must believe rather than this is Jesus. Look what he's done for you. People are crazy about Jesus. They want to know about Jesus. The most secular people learn about Jesus in their college campus, but they don't want all the garbage that we've added on that says this is what Christianity is. They just don't want it. Can you tell I'm passionate about this? I cannot tell you how many times I've talked with a person, particularly a young person, about what it means to walk with the Lord, and they just can't grab it because they think walking with Jesus means 5,000 things that we've added on. There is freedom in Jesus. Freedom. And maybe you too, I find that people who often are in very different walk with the Lord than I am have some of the most insightful and helpful things to contribute to my walk with the Lord. And not because it's some new piece of knowledge, but because they are open in some way for Christ to speak to them. I was talking with my nephew last night. He's graduating from College is going to be an architect, He's an awesome, awesome young man. And he told me about the guy he works with, a firm in North County. So this guy is very creative, coming up with all kinds of ideas on, on how to kind of build communities and it's sort of his whole thing. He works here, he, he works down in Mexico, he travels around, uh, really around the globe, but a lot around the United States, just kind of lecturing, makes huge sums of money lecturing on what you can do to build a community in such a way that it makes it more community-oriented. It's kind of his, his deal. So he's telling me, my nephew, about a project he had. And he said the project is what they call a paper freeway, meaning a freeway that was planned to be built, you know, infrastructure that was supposed to be there, and for some reasons they never built it. And he said there is in San Diego a large swath of land that is a paper freeway. They're never going to build there, and so you have this kind of large corridor. And the thing that connects this corridor is these four or five church buildings. And so my boss, he said, came up with this idea of what if we took that corridor and developed it and turned it into like large parks and then the people in the church could help maintain it and stuff. Obviously the city would, would pay for that and they would have their crews and all, but then the churches could use it for different projects to help the community together. But he said they don't want to go for it because the churches don't want to work together. So my boss just kind of has thrown up his hands and said, well, I guess we're never going to do that. Because we have the wrong idea that if you don't think like me, live like me, worship like me, act like me, read the Bible the way I do, then you must not low God. And therefore, I should separate myself from you. God, help us. There is one Lord and one Spirit and one church. And it all is to work in one heart 
and one mind for the glory and purpose of the Father. Amen? It's what the Bible teaches. And that's what we ought to be doing. Galatians 5 says this. Going back to freedom, that we're free to follow Jesus in unique and wonderful ways. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Now Paul is specifically talking about from all of the legalism. You don't have to go through certain rites and rituals. In, in their case, it was particularly Judaizers, they called it, that said that people had to go through circumcision and other ritual to, to come into a relationship with God. No, Paul says God's called you to freedom. He set you free from that. And then he says, stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Listen to me. If I ever stand up here and tell you, you got to do these five things to you know, be right with God, you just go right to that passage and say, no, I don't think so. There's one way to be right with God. It's committing your life to Jesus Christ and letting his blood wash away your sin. And then walking with him day by day, letting his light break into your darkness, expose what's there, and begin to transform you in the loving, merciful, gracious, powerful way that only he can. If I ever try to impose rules and regulations on you, run for your life, because I now too have become as dangerous as the teachers of the law Jesus was talking about. And if any pastor tries to impose rules and regulations, run for your life. You know what? You have as much capability as any theologian who ever lived to talk to the living God and to hear from the living God and to open the scriptures and to read it and let the living God speak to you like a father to a loving child. You have that ability. God never intended for us to be boxed up he intended for us as his church, as his family, to serve the world on his behalf and to the glory of Jesus Christ. That's what he intended. And that's what we ought to do. So there is no one size fits all. The other thing we do, I don't want to take a lot of time with this, but the other thing we do is that we always have kind of the church vision, right? What is the vision? And then I, as the senior pastor, be the visionary, and I'm going to like Moses, go up on Mount Moriah, I'm going to get the vision and I'm going to bring it down to you, which is about as non-biblical in the New Testament as it can be. But I'm going to give you the vision because I'm the anointed man of God and here's the vision and then you all need to follow my vision that I give to you if you want to be guys and girls in good standing, right? Yeah. Show, somebody show me that in the Bible. I'm still looking for it. I see only one vision. Jesus gives it and he says it like this. Father, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the vision. That's what God's vision is. That is the one vision that God is taking back the world. And that he wants to do it through you as you walk at the unique and wonderful and freeing way that God speaks directly to you to live. And then guys like me come along and should encourage you in that and should help you in that and should, should pray with you in that. But it's you and God walking it out. Not me saying, go do this because this is my vision that God gave me. I reject that as sin. That's how I feel about it. And I think that the scripture is completely in that tone, in that flavor. Just talking with some of the guys in the staff this morning. I'm just going to say this, take it for what it is, okay? The popular trend in America right now is that the high-powered leader writes a book. Got to write a book. You get the book out there, and you become kind of the religious superstar. One of the largest churches in America, that pastor said, well, the people will bring their friends, and that's how their friends will come the first time, but the pastor, his personality is the one that brings them the second time. Can you imagine my personality? Are you kidding me? And so his dynamic personality is what's going to draw the people back. So what that has led to is what's known as the multi-site or the venue approach. Which, and it is popular. Every large church in America is doing this. Churches in San Diego County are experimenting with this and doing this. And this is how it works. You start a venue. Say we're going to start a venue, okay? We say, hey, in Alpine, let's start a venue. So we get a building, and we send Dave and Ray Ann Colson out, and they're going to be the pastors there. But Dave is never going to preach. 
Not really. He might do Bible studies in the evening. But what about in the morning, Sunday morning, when people gather? Well, Dave is not going to preach. You know why? Because I'm the anointed man. And therefore, they're going to have uh, like a live stream of me on a big screen. And so Dave will come up and welcome people and do his pastoral thing. And maybe they will or won't have their own small praise band. And then Dave will say, now here's Kevin. And he'll walk off the platform because he doesn't have enough of the spirit of Jesus, I guess. And so then it will be my big ugly mug. It's, it's bad enough this size. Imagine it 12 feet. And that's the popular trend because everybody knows that personality is the one that's going to grow the church. Excuse me? I thought Jesus was the personality that's going to grow the church. What are we thinking? Why are we marketing and boxing up what Jesus has meant for his glory? God, help us. And why are we damning people to come into institutions instead of freeing them in the name of Jesus Christ? Why are we doing it? I'll tell you why. Because there's money in it. Because there's popularity in it. And because we're just darn sure that I'm the anointed man of God. Therefore, people got to hear what I got to say. Or it's never going to work. I have a friend that has a 7,000 member church. He's a great guy. But their whole philosophy is, you bring your friends in here and I'll preach to them because we all know that you can't lead your friends to Jesus Christ. They would never say that, but that's exactly what their philosophy is. You have got to be kidding me. The power is in Jesus. The power comes out of people as they walk in relationship with Jesus. As they willingly choose to love people wherever the Lord has them. In their home, in their neighborhood, their workplace, in the classroom. Whatever moment Jesus has them in and brings that person, maybe somebody they've known a long time and are praying for, or somebody they just meet. The power is in Jesus. And he works through his church. Which is you. To bless and to strengthen the world and to draw people to himself that they too might be saved. We have confined the church, God help us leaders. Instead of saying, you are free, permission given, go serve Jesus wherever he takes you. You have what you need. You have Jesus. You have his blood that washes away your sins. You have the Holy Spirit that lives in you. You have the scriptures and you have a unique calling and anointing and vision to do what God wants you to do permission given by God go and do it bear fruit for his name man I, I'm tired this is exhausting I'm exhausted Population in America grows like crazy. You guys know that. The population uh, is not going to stop growing anytime soon. America still offers the world, in my opinion, a great hope for some kind of prosperity and freedom. There are, in this day that we live in, a large number of people coming from the Middle East as refugees because... To live where they live, their lives are on the line. And as they come in, and as America increases in its population, instead of, instead of freely embracing what God is, is doing, we box ourselves in more. Here's really what I'm wanting to say. While you see the population of America going like this, you see the activity in the church going like this. That's because people don't want to be boxed. They want to know God. They want to know, does God make a real difference in your life? Because if he does, maybe he'll make a difference in my life. Is God really helping you in these things that plague every human being? Because if he is, maybe he can help me too. You know what? You want to invite your friends to, to our church gathering? More power to you. Fantastic. That's great. You ought to do that. That's, that's, a, that's a cool way to invite people into something that's important to you. But the activity of Jesus is around the world, not just in a building. And tomorrow morning, as you're walking along doing your thing, the Lord may speak to you and say, I want you to show love to this person. I want you to do something here. 
God may engage you in some kind of conversation with somebody you never met that you didn't even know about. Let me give you the fourth one. This ties right into this. The fourth is this, living life purposely. Living life purposefully. Living life purposefully just means that I am always focused, always paying attention to what God is doing in and around me, and I'm always available, best I can be. It's something i got to grow in, but always available to whatever the Lord gives me at that moment. You know, just go back to the whole idea of love. We live in a world that is absolutely loveless. So when you just choose, in the power of Jesus, to love someone in the simplest ways, you'll be surprised what a blessing that brings into their life and how that helps a heart open to the God that put that love in you in the first place. Scripture says this, 1 Peter 3, we'll close with this. He says to people who know Jesus personally, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life, meaning you're in a relationship with Him now as your Savior, as your Lord. You follow Him, you hear Him, you obey Him. Worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, isn't that awesome? Because someone will ask you if you live for Jesus. That doesn't mean you live a perfect religious life. It doesn't mean you're holier, quote-unquote, than other people. It means you walk with Jesus. And he transforms you on that journey. As they ask about the hope you have, because they see stuff in your life, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. I believe that every follower of Jesus Christ, every day, has some kind of opportunity to respond to what the Spirit of God is doing. But I also believe that most of those opportunities are lost because we're living in a wrong direction. I want to close in prayer. I've gone a little long today. But I just want to bless you guys. I want to encourage you. I, I didn't mean to yell. I normally save that for my kids. But, uh, but, you know, this stuff is so important. It's so important for you and for me and for everyone who knows Jesus to break free from the constraints that religion has put on us and begin to live for Jesus Christ in his power. Live in a relational way. God works through relationships. He's a God of relationship. And my whole heart is that we as a fellowship and, and that every Christian would live in the, in the love and the freedom that that relationship with Jesus Christ brings. If I could do one thing, it would be ignite you guys to live that way, to just start walking with the Lord in that way and recognize that church is not something we do or a place we go or an institution or an organization. You are the church. And that as you live your life each day, God wants to use you wherever you are. And God wants to bless you wherever you are. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. And I just, uh, well, Lord, I just believe that you so much want to bring powerful, powerful renewal and revival to your people in the United States. Lord, I believe that in some ways we have really walked in wrong directions. We've lived in wrong directions. And God, I don't mean in any way to uh, say anything hypercritical about my brothers in Christ or sisters in Christ who are other pastors. I don't mean to break them down or to make it seem like I'm right and they're all wrong. Lord, I just so much hunger for us to live a true, unique faith in Jesus Christ, to, for all of us to do that and to unleash your church to be all that you've desired it to be. I think, Lord, like the spiritual leaders of Jesus' day, we have harnessed your people and we've constrained your people and we've misled your people. Lord, I, I, I don't want to do that. I so much want your people to be free to follow you in all the fullness of what that looks like, all the grace and all the truth and all the love that you have for every one of them. So I just pray for me and Wayne and Dave and Sylvester that, that we would be of that spirit and, and would really try to empower your folks to, to live in that relationship with you, Lord. Ultimately, they don't need us at all. They just need you. And then we come along as, as helpers and friends and brothers and servants to help them in their relationship with you. So, Lord, I just pray that we would live in that spirit that you've given us to live in. Thank you for this time, Lord. And as we close with just a moment of worship, just pray that, that you would sink these things into our spirits now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you guys stand up? I just want to uh, say a final prayer.
and uh, we'll be done for the day. Father, we bless you for this day, and we thank you again for the grace and love and truth you bring our way. We thank you, Lord, that you are all sufficient for us, even to guide us, to care for us, and that, Lord, you've called us to help one another in our journey with you. Father, my, my uh, greatest prayer today would be for anyone who has never stepped into a journey with you, who's never received Christ Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, that they would step into that personal relationship with you, would be born again, would have sin completely washed away, would know that their eternal, is, uh, eternal life is absolutely secure in you, and would begin to live in that joy and that love and that hope that only Jesus Christ can bring into a life. Father, we praise you and thank you for this day. Go with us now, Lord, we, we thank you. And use us for your glory this week, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys.